The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Democracy is in peril if we don't deal with the corruption of our information ecosystem. That, according to Nobel Prize winning journalist Maria Ressa. She is here tonight on Standing Up to Dictators and Social Media. Then we'll find out about Ontario's plan to revitalize the Northlander train service and to integrate transit fares across the GTA from Associate Minister of Transportation Stan Cho. It's Monday, April 10th, and that's next on The Agenda. She was once a great believer in the promise of social media. She is all too aware of how authoritarian politicians, including in her home country, the Philippines, harness technology to sow hate, fear, and disinformation that can ultimately undermine democracy. Nobel Peace Prize laureate Maria Ressa is co-founder and CEO of the online news platform Rappler. And her new book, How to Stand Up to a Dictator, The Fight for Our Future, offers sage insights for all of us. And Maria Ressa joins us now here in our studio. It is such a pleasure to meet you. I've seen you speak many times in the past, but what a pleasure to have you here in our studio. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. I'm gonna start with a map here. Sheldon, you wanna bring this up? You know this all too well. This is the state of democracy today in the world. This is a new report from the independent Varieties of Democracy Institute. That's out of the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And it shows 72% of the world's population, that's 5.7 billion people, now live under autocracies. And that is a 46% increase from just a decade ago. The worst decline is happening in the Asia Pacific region, where it's reached 1978 levels. In other words, more than 35 years of global democratic advances have been erased in the last decade. Maria Ressa, what is killing democracy in your view? Well, I mean, for me, the, the, the fire that set the kindling on fire is technology. And the after technology platforms took over the distribution of information, of news, we saw um, a, a, an overemphasis on profit at all costs. There was an abdication of responsibility of the public sphere. That kind of advertising marketing system, which was the way it was originally set up, was exploited by geopolitical power. We are electing illiberal leaders, democracy globally. If we don't take the right steps forward, if we don't fix the corruption of our information ecosystem, this is going to continue accelerating and, and really D-Day is 2024. Because? Because between now and then, there will be 90 elections globally, right? We don't have integrity of facts. A 2018 MIT study said that lies spread six times faster than facts on social media. Hmm. You know, you add fear, anger, hate, and you will spread even faster. That's the incentive structure. So the incentive structure is upside down. The new gatekeepers have said, lie. I'll reward you, keep lying, I'll keep rewarding you. What kind of, if you were doing that to a child, what kind of adult does that person become? Well, now we're seeing we're in the upside down and while everything is deceptively familiar, the incentive structure rewards the lies, rewards hate, this is part of what has led to 72% of the world under authoritarian rule. This is not a new phenomenon, though, because I, I can't remember who said it, but there's this famous quote about a lie can get all the way around the world before the truth has a chance to put its pants on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what's different? Social media has made it different in what way? The pace. The speed. It's exponential. Yeah. It's the pace and the, and the quantity. Right, so big data, just moving to big data from an Excel sheet to big data. And I think we don't quite fathom that, right? Big data allows, for example, uh, in the case, in my case, 90 hate messages per hour to pound me to silence. Mm. There, information has not just been corrupted, it's been weaponized. And for those free speech advocates, we are free speech advocates, mm -hmm. but we are also gatekeepers with a set of standards and ethics. Without these, when information is weaponized, when it's used to take your narrative out and replace it, it's, it's how democracy begins to die and has died. 
That word gatekeepers has become a bit of a swear word in Canada, I have to say. The, the, the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada today uses it very effectively, I should add, as a, uh, as a pejorative thing. He says, enough of the gatekeepers. Uh, you, you gatekeepers are the people who are keeping too many Canadians down and not everybody's getting a chance to participate in democracy adequately because of that. Does he have a point? No. <laughs> no <laughs> because, look, um, there's something, regardless of whatever opinion you have, there's a set of facts. And what's happened is when lies spread faster than facts, uh, you, you begin, there are no facts. You say a lie a million times, it becomes a fact, right? So the three sentences I've said over and over since the, in the no, including in the Nobel lectures, if you, without facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without these three, we have no shared reality. We can't begin to solve a problem. We can't have a conversation. You can't deal with climate change. You cannot have democracy. Why are gatekeepers important? Because when we were in charge, news organizations were in charge of the public sphere, you were legally liable for that. We were governed by a set of standards and ethics that our public can see, that our public can hold us accountable. When tech took over that role, uh, took, they took the money, they yeah. took the business model, but at the same time, they abdicated responsibility for protecting us. Uh, you know, the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, Chris Wiley, actually pointed out that the toaster in your home has more regulations governing it <laughs> than, this, than this. This device that you're carrying. Which is yes. actually manipulating your mm -hmm. emotions, ultimately your mind, ultimately your yeah. vote. Well, let's talk about your home country because we have often heard social media disinformation. Essentially, the Philippines is like the canary in the coal mine when it comes to that. Explain what that, what that looks like to you. It's really interesting. Part of it is we were first adapters to the tech, right? I mean, look, I, I drank the Kool-Aid in 2011 when I saw the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. I was... We set up Rappler in 2012. I thought technology could help jumpstart development. But by 2014, so it was only a year or so, Arab Spring became the Arab Winter. And, uh, and we continued to grow, but we couldn't, we couldn't have fathomed what happened in 2016. So the two biggest stories of my career have been attacks against America tested in the Philippines, mm. attacks against the West. Um, the first was uh, in 1995 when um, these terrorists came in. They had a plot to hijack planes and crash them into buildings. And when 9-11 happened, I remembered the interrogation report I had from probably the first pilot recruited by al-Qaeda. He was then in a, in a prison, a high security prison in the United States. They talked about, this is in a 1995 interrogation document that I had, plot to hijack planes and crash them into buildings and named the targets. Mm -hmm. The World Trade Center, um, the Transamerica building, the Pentagon. Pentagon. There were other yeah. things there, right? The second time is this, the information warfare that is now that has now become molecular at a democracy level that is targeting individuals in a democracy um, we began to see it in 2016 i was shocked that it could be used this way but um, russian disinformation you know the former kgb chair yuri andropov said that disinformatia is like cocaine you take mm -hmm. it once or twice you're okay but if you take it all the time you become a changed person we are changed people. And the enabler for the rise of autocracy, as you've seen in that map, the enabler is technology, the social media. We are electing these illiberal leaders democratically, and they are crushing institutions from within their own countries, but they're not staying in their countries. They're also allying with each other in new global alliances like Belarus and Russia. Okay, let me give the flip side just for the Please. heck of it, which is to say, Black Lives Matter, the Arab Spring, uh, the democratization efforts happening in Iran could not happen without a vibrant social media sphere. Is yes. that fair to say as well? Fair to say, but Black Lives Matter, these very same things were weaponized. Were, so what did Russian disinformation do in the United States? Identity politics. They hit both sides of Black Lives Matter. and. You know, I feel sorry for anyone in government today trying to lead because these fissures have been split wide open yeah. and we don't listen anymore, right? In a world that's completely, that is extremely nuanced where we need to take surgical 
moves. How do you do this when your population is being insidiously manipulated? So Duterte in your country was really one of the masters of doing this, right? He was one of the best. What other illiberal leaders do you look at around the world to sit today and say they're using the same playbook? Well, I'll say, you know, what we've seen in the Philippines is that the Duterte and Marcos disinformation networks were working together. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason you have a Marcos Jr. today, the only son and namesake back in power, wins overwhelmingly on the vote is because the disinformation began in 2014, not coincidentally, the same time that the meta-narrative for the annexation of Crimea that was later used by Putin to actually invade Ukraine itself. This is when they were all seeded, right? You see the meta-narrative, that's when our history began to change in front of our eyes. Um, so back to the Philippines. <laughs> um, look, I think that part of what we're struggling with is um, we had weak institutions, endemic corruption, and what we saw with social media was, you know, in, in the book I talk about uh, how the recommendation engine of Facebook splintered our reality. You would, in the West you call it echo chambers, but you know, in 2016 when Duterte was elected, and he's not the mastermind of this, right? This is, these are people around him, but if you were pro-Duterte, you move further right. If you were anti-Duterte, you move further left. And that is because the recommendation engine was using friends of friends. Hmm. They were recommending friends of friends. So that's, that divides, and then the recommendation engine for content polarizes. I, you know, we we were, I mean, I did a lot of the terrorism, the radicalization it takes two weeks. Mm -hmm. So when you're fed this stuff, um, it, it moves quickly. The center cannot hold. Yates, yes. As the expression goes. Uh, okay, you know, Facebook. I do want to talk to you about Facebook because I know you're not a fan. You've called it the greatest, one of the gravest threats to our democracy. And yet, I suspect when a lot of people think about Facebook, they're thinking about pictures of cats and family and all of this kind of thing, and they're wondering, Maria, how can this be such a grave threat to our... I think you'll see that would have changed, right? Most people start getting, started getting off because it's of something I call the toxic sludge, right? Um, what gets you the widest distribution? And it's not just Facebook. I'll look at YouTube and the the clustering algorithms that recommend content to you. A recent study actually showed that Jair Bolsonaro was a far-right fringe figure, but the clustering algorithm that put his supporters together with every conspiracy theories created a support group that in the real world would never have met, but that buoyed him to the presidency and ultimately led to the violence that was January 8th, clustering algorithms, right? So. Um, Facebook, I think more and more people are beginning to understand the problem. Because let me be optimistic, because I sound so negative on this. <laughs> the good thing is that technology has shown us that people all over the world, regardless of language, culture, or nations, are fundamentally the same. They want the we're, same things in life. And we're being manipulated by the same technology. Hmm. I mean, literally, right? Our biology has been used against us to change the way we think and ultimately the way we act. If you don't have integrity of facts, you cannot have integrity of the vote. This is why the cascading failures go to how we are governed, go to the structures we set up in the real world. Do you take any satisfaction from the news that Zuckerberg has just laid off tens of thousands of people at his company and that fewer people may be on Facebook today as a result? I, you know, I would love for him to be enlightened, him, Elon Musk, any of the big tech CEOs to, to actually say, you know, we see the damage that's being done. We're going to be reliable gatekeepers. We're going to take these, make these difficult decisions. The decisions you and I make as a journalist because you are accountable and we're accountable to the public and we want to help democracy grow, right? So no, I. I they're going through what we have gone through. Um, but that doesn't mean a solution will be found. We need to stop the corruption. We need to stop the lies. Otherwise, you know, I think I talk about the information ecosystem as a river. It's polluted. It's polluted with lies. If you're on any social media platform, everything you post is, is pulled together by machine learning to create a model of you that knows you better than you know yourself, has all your relationships, right? Then AI comes in and takes all of our models and 
This is the mother load database. That's upstream. Change the word model and use the word clone, right? So this is our clone, our weaknesses sold to the highest bidder. That's what micro-targeting is. And then what we're doing is we're saying, for the people who think content moderation, let me take some of this polluted water. You drop the pill to clean up the water and then you throw it back in. It's going to take us a while, but we need to stop the factory of lies. Are you as concerned about TikTok, which, of course, increasing numbers of Western governments are, I know, I mean, we work for the province of Ontario. We were told to take it off. We can't have TikTok on here anymore. You got it on yours anymore? I never was on it. You never put it on. Because if Facebook is a blunt mallet, TikTok is a surgical probe. Hmm. The less options you have, the less choice you have, uh, and you just keep scrolling, um, the more control this has on you. So, you know, and of course then the link to, can a private company in China actually say no to the Chinese government? A, a wonderful question, a great question. I want to talk to you about trust. And you, you talked about gatekeepers, and the sad reality is, while you and I both think that we do work that is important and require, you know, we would like the public to buy in, and we think that we, what we do is empirically based and, in fact, and is worthy of trust. I'm looking at numbers in Canada here. This is a 2022 Reuters report. Trust in Canadian media has dropped 13 percent in the last seven years. It now is at just 42 percent. 42 percent. How much of that loss of trust is because we're just not very good anymore at what we should be doing? No, I, I think you're actually, that's still pretty solid compared to the rest of the world, right? So Canada, hold the line, you know, but part of that is why? Because your penetration rate for social media is now at 87%, hmm. right? Uh, look, you, you said, you know, we should get rid of the gatekeepers. Let's get rid of traffic lights. I, I, I well, didn't say we should. Yeah, I know, the I prime said, minister. I, I'm yeah. not, the guy who wants to be prime minister. Who wants to be prime minister. He's the opposition leader oh, right now. Oh, my gosh. Oh, he's a populist. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, because social media helps him. Yes. Right? And he's so, very good on it. And again, what, does, what are the incentive structures of social media? You go right back to this, right? So the question that I have is, if you take away all the traffic lights, what happens? Chaos. Accidents. Chaos. <laughs> These laws are in place. Facts are there to anchor us. But if you don't have facts, you cannot have rule of law, right? So I guess, you know, I live in a country where populists won. Mm -hmm. And we had, um, the, the reason I wrote the book is because you can replace dictator with bully. You know, we live in a world where rule of law should be stopping mm -hmm. the bully should be protecting the weak, the silent, should be, should have the checks and balances against the dictator, right? So what does a more trustworthy journalism look like in this era where you're fighting lies 24 seven? So again, I think, I think this is really given everything else that's there, right? So the first thing is the distribution on social media since you've, you're now up at 87%. Mm. That incentive structure actually commodifies news and, and incentivizes really bad journalism, mm. right? If you're doing investigative journalism, in-depth conversations that you have, uh, you're not gonna get the widest distribution on social media. That's the first thing, right? So what will reach people? kind of like crappy things, you know? <laughs> um, so that's the first. And then the other part is what else will reach people? Things that make them, it's an outrage economy. Mm -hmm. We have standards and ethics. We do not insidiously manipulate it. We have a profession that, you know, if you're doing television, you learn to tell the story. You, it's the micro macro. We spend our careers doing that, but we're not gonna lie to you. We're not going to manipulate you in the way some do and are allowed to do on social media. We're not going to lie to you, but you can't help but watch cable television in the United States. And thankfully, we don't have it here in Canada. We have pretty straight ahead cable television channels here. Still. But, but f still, yes, still. yes. But Fox News is just in a different business from the rest of us. I think that's fair to say. But MSNBC uh, has its days where it looks like it's in the tank for the Democratic Party. Where's the way out of all of this? It looks like, it, it just looks like a respect for empirically provable facts is not that important to too many people anymore. No, I think these are cascading failures of mm -hmm. that first incentive structure that was turned upside down. 
if you spread lies faster than facts, then journalists have no recourse here, right? Like, and I know this because because this uh, uh, social media was used to attack me and Rappler. Yeah. You know, it is both a curse and a blessing that I was getting 90 hate messages per hour. What's the blessing? The blessing is I saw all the data and I began to look at it as data, not as content. Yeah. And I stood on firm ground when I realized that this was meant to pound me to silence. It was replacing a meta narrative of <laughs> journalists as gatekeepers with journalists or criminals, right? You could see this, you could see this in the data. So I think that's the first step, but look, Journalism is not gonna survive if the incentive structure for distribution of content are lies. So the question is more to our audience. Can you live in a world where lies are what you're going to get? So we have to put it back on, on the public. I think we need to keep doing what we're doing, mm -hmm. right? We need to keep holding the line and, the, and that means there are greater sacrifices. These same technology companies have crumbled our business model, advertising is dead. Because who would advertise for print or, or TV where you see it one time versus micro-targeting at a molecular level, right? The ROIs are far better on technology, cheaper as well. But you are killing the group that has been set up to try to hold power to account. So we do have to, we do have to say to members of the public, you are in this with us. You yes. are partially responsible as well. Not just partially. You're, you're very much responsible. Yes. You got to make absolutely. better. You got to make good choices. Well, the other part is that our, our journalism is not only commodified; it is also, uh, what's the right way to, to phrase this? Um, when you cater to the lowest common denominator, mm. the, when I talk about this in the Nobel lecture as toxic sludge, mm. when you cater, when popularity becomes mob rule, this is where social media is, right? So, so we weather the attacks online. We've been attacked by information operations. Journalists are the first attack in almost every country you look at. You ask me where I look, I look at Brazil. I look at Turkey. I look at Hungary. I look at India. I look at the United States. You know, there was a period of time when the Philippines was far more civilized than the United States. This is leading up to their midterm elections, mm. right? The division. Why? You are targeted. You have New Zealand. I look at the five eyes. You know what we used to call it, the them. five eyes. You are. Mm -hmm. And women are attacked. In 2017, in the Philippines, we had the data for this. Women are attacked at least 10 times more than men. Mm. Right? Because the goal is to take you out at the molecular level, at the individual level. And these tech companies are enabling this geopolitical manipulation mm. at scale. Generally on this program, we don't ask personal questions. We keep it all very much on, on the content. But you're Maria Ressa, and uh, you're a big deal. And I can't have you in that chair without asking you how you are attempting to deal with the notion that you've got trumped up charges against you back in the Philippines and can you go can you go home again and be safe what do you think it, all of these attacks began in 2016 right so it's been many years and there was a period of time when my lawyers thought i was foolish and i kept going back i mean i've had uh, look I feel like you know, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're in Silicon Valley, you know you, that 99% of startups fail. Yep. That 1% has to go through the valley of death. I feel like Philippine democracy has gone through the valley of death, despite the fact that we have a Marcos back as president, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and in my case, holding the line, doing the right thing has been the right thing because I've watched the charges against me go from, you know, 14 investigations in 2017, 10 arrest warrants in 2019, mm. you know, a little bit over. Um, it went from 103 years in prison to just last January, I had four criminal tax evasion charges thrown out. Both Rappler and I were acquitted. It took four years and two months, but that decision actually said, you know, these cases should never even have made it to court. Hmm. But four years and two months, but you know, we're coming out of it. You're so, coming out of it, but you still face a I lifetime do. in jail. And I actually have to go all the way to the Supreme Court to ask for permission to travel, hmm. to be here. It's no longer a lifetime. Now we're down to maybe a decade. <laughs> you know? You're laughing about <laughs> From it. 
You know, it's that's progress. Like, it's a little bit like gallows humor. You know, it yeah. is what it is. It's yeah. like pollution. God, you know, it's like climate change. We have to do something about it. And I am. You know what? I'm talking to you about why you need to jump in. Sorry, the last thing you you, you kind of ask this, but journalists. News organizations are not powerful enough to do this on our own. And in 2021, the Nobel Prize was given to journalists. But in 2022, it was given to civil society. So anyone watching, I come to you, you know, this is, it's not out there. The war in Ukraine seems like it's far away from you. Um, you could say, you know, we're okay here in Canada. You're not okay. Um, the war is here, in your phone, in your pocket. In the Nobel lecture, I talked about an individual battle for integrity, an individual battle for facts. We must win this, each of us. And that mesh is how we win the war. You do put a provocative question out there, though, which is yes. what, what are you prepared to do and how much are you prepared to do to safeguard your democracy? That is, that is a really tough question. I know there are people all over the world who are prepared to give their lives for it. I think most people aren't. Most people just want to get through the day, right? How do we answer that question? This is why I'm jumping up and down, kind of, right? Like, yeah. please, please, please understand this moment is different. Um, there are surveys that say you don't want to watch the news at all because coming out of COVID, it's you want good news, you know? This is the world we live in. Yeah. And this moment, if you do not jump in and help, we could lose everything. I've covered Southeast Asia, and I've been both in the Philippines after 1986, the fall of Marcos, almost 21 years, and then in 1998, the fall of Suharto after almost 32 years in power. There is a nostalgia for strongman rule in my country. India has the same. And you want someone else to make those decisions for you, these populist leaders. But understand that democracy is difficult. And this is now calling for your help. If you want the populist, ask the questions. You will ask the questions. How will they solve these problems? Look at it, because if we don't jump in, we we look at the end of democracy. And you know, between now and 2024, there will be 90 nine zero elections globally. And 2024 is a tipping point. It will either, three major elections will push us off the cliff, democracy will die, or it'll crumble slowly. The death by a thousand cuts continues. When will Canada have its elections? Well, we don't know that yet. It's right. a minority parliament, who knows? Um, can we say, let's hope the pendulum starts swinging back towards democracy? Let's hope for that, right? Not just hope, please let's work, work for, for it. Gotcha. How to Stand Up to a Dictator, The Fight for Our Future is Maria Ressa's latest, and we recommend it wholeheartedly. Thank you so much for coming into TVO tonight and sharing your time with us. It's a great honor to have you here. Thank you for having me. Trying to get around Ontario these days is apparently such a tough nut to crack. The current provincial government actually has two ministers of transportation. Whether it's subways, LRTs, highways, roads, or rail service, there's a lot going on. Let's see if Ontario is on the right track with Stan Cho. He is the Associate Minister of Transportation and the PC member for Willowdale, and we are delighted to welcome you to TVO. Thank you so much for having me. First visit to this show, I First think. ever. Very yeah, happy great. to be here. Good to have you here. I've never seen this before, where you have two ministers of transportation in the same cabinet. Premier Doug Ford has had that since he was sworn in in 2018. How come? Why do we need two? Well, Steve, we've never had this much transit being built before. I mean, this is a country that's seeing hundreds of thousands of people move every single year. We have a transit deficit to begin with. Uh, that means the largest transit expansion plan is underway. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, now, that's outside of just modernizing fares and connecting the grid and cross-boundary service, all sorts of things going on. We definitely need those two ministers. Caroline Mulroney is the other one. Yes. And, like, how does it work? Do you guys divvy up files, or what, how does it work? Yeah, there are uh, different files for, for Minister Mulroney and myself. I'm very much focused on, on the transit end of things, modernizing Presto and fair service integration uh, and Northlander passenger rail. And, and Minister Mulroney has got a lot on her plate with the transportation network and all of the other work to keep our province moving. Okay, since you mentioned fair integration, let's dive into that and we'll start there. We do have a bit of an unusual situation in the greater Toronto area whereby you can get on a train, a GO train, 
from one of the suburbs and come to the city, and then maybe you have to hop on the TTC to go somewhere else after that, and you got to pay one fare to go on go, and you pay a second fare to get onto the TTC, and a lot of people think that doesn't make a lot of sense anymore. Do you think it should be this way? <laughs> Absolutely not, Steve. I was that kid who took Leslie 51 trying to visit friends in York Region. Then you got to hop on the go fragmented uh, systems. And I think that's what happens when you plan a transit system without expecting the level of growth we've had in the 1950s uh, and 60s. And so what we have today is a climate of fragmented transit uh, agencies with systems that aren't connected to each other through no, no real fault of their own. But the time is now to talk, have those conversations and take serious steps towards integrating that system because at the end of the day, nobody cares what color bus you're getting onto. They just want to get from point A to point B. No, that's right. But but you've got Toronto running one system, Peel runs another system, Mississauga runs another system, Holton runs a system, Hamilton runs a system, York's got... I mean, they've all got different systems. So is it your job to sort of put everybody in a room and, and knock their heads together and say, we don't leave until we get a deal here? Well, it's uh, it's not quite that uh, dark. I was yes. kind of hoping it might be, because that sounds kind of dramatic. But, <laughs> but okay. absolutely, that is what's been happening. Actually, for over two years now, Minister Mulroney began that work. Uh, Minister Surma continued it on uh, with what's called a fair service integration table, an FSI table, which brings uh, together all of the transit agencies throughout the GTHA. Uh, it was co-chaired by myself and Rick Leary, the CEO of the TTC. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely the conversations that we were having. What would it take to integrate our transit systems to the point where we could allow for cross-boundary service? Uh, and how do we have the important discussions of it, transit being more affordable? Can we eliminate the local fare? What would it take to actually have that happen? Uh, and that included the TTC, and I'm proud to say that uh, that's where we are now, where the province will be fully funding uh, to make transit agencies whole, the, the ability to transfer from your local transit agency to go for simply the go price, and that includes Toronto. Okay, so tell us how this is going to work, because, of course, the, the, the promise of the TTC has always been that whether you're going from Young and Bloor to Young and Wellesley, which is not very far, mm -hmm. or whether you're going from Islington in the west to, I don't know, let's say Warden in the east, which is very far, it's the same price. Is that going to change? Well, right now, the TTC makes their own decisions for their fair pricing, but what is going to change, Steve, is imagine this. Um, let's say you live in Barrie. Uh, and you want to visit your friend in Fort York. Now, you, most people are going to drive that because there's three different transit agencies, uh, and you got to deal with traffic, and you got to pay for parking. There's no real al other alternative, uh, but now there is. And if, so you can take your Barry Transit, connect to the GO line, uh, come to Union Station, take a streetcar out to Fort York, all for your GO fare. Because uh, what our government is doing is, is, is making whole the transit agencies in Barrie, so that fare is free when you connect to GO. And now, at the end of this year, when you connect to the TTC, your TTC fare will also be fair. So if you think about it, free rather. So if you think about it that way, it's actually a three-for-one uh, fare arrangement, which we believe is going to take a lot of cars off the road and provide the option of transit for a lot more people out there. You got any studies to say how many cars off the road that'll take? So that is what we're working on that now. What we do know is there's about 1.8 million uh, cars that make that uh, trip into the city, uh, in and out through the GTHA every single day. Um, we, the whole point of this, uh, Steve, is to raise sort of all tides and, and, and increase ridership because we know most uh, transit agencies are still suffering uh, post-pandemic uh, and we're trying to increase those numbers, provide additional options while building that historic transit, uh, as I said, the largest expansion in history. Not enough just to get shovels in the ground and build new lines. We need to make transit affordable and incent people to actually take it. So does that mean you can use your Presto card on any one of these services? That's correct. Um, and just last year, we also introduced the new option to most of the GTHA where you can tap your credit card. Uh, debit is coming later this year to those transit agencies. And I'm proud to say that the hardware refresh is ongoing for the TTC to have those options available. Available as okay, well. that's what I wondered about because I know I, I was in New York not too long ago and I just took my phone and you can right? That's mm -hmm. how you can get into the New York subway system there, but we've never been able to do that here. That's right, and I think Asia and Europe uh, had that for decades, and uh, it's better late than never, but I'm proud to say it's coming to Toronto. Do you know when? Do you know when all this is going to happen? So it should be at the end of this year uh, for the sort of uh, rest of the debit network for the 905. It's already in place across the Go network and everywhere else in the 905 uh, with your credit card. That includes your Apple Pay, by the way, so your smart mm -hmm. device will work on, on those devices. The TTC currently, through the hardware uh, refresh, uh, we're getting that on board. Uh, we expect that to be operational this year as well. Now, of course, the last question on this. The conventional wisdom over the years has always been the TTC is kind of like the big brother of all of these family of systems. And they have been somewhat, I don't know if hostile is right. Well, maybe it is hostile about, you know, 
being a part of something with all of these other services because they are the biggest and most expensive. Are, are they still feeling that way about all this? Well, certainly the TTC is the biggest. Uh, it is the largest transit agency in our entire country, uh, in fact. And, and they have some legitimate concerns. Uh, you know, what about job protection? What about service cuts? Uh, and that's why we've had these discussions for the better, well, over two years now, to make sure. And I, I, in a letter to City Council, I encouraged uh, Council and the TTC to have discussions about cross-boundary service, but not at the expense of those two important issues. No service cuts, no job losses. We value the hardworking uh, people of the TTC. And that's why the government of Ontario is stepping in to make sure that we are fully funding the program so that, you know, there are no revenue losses for the largest transit agency out there. And um, that's in addition to all of the safe restart funding we uh, provided during a very difficult uh, Last question on this. Yeah. I, I lied. Uh, price tag on this, on fair integration, price tag is how much? So we're working that out now. Uh, uh, you know, it's been an evolutionary process from two years ago. You could imagine as, as you're bringing all these autonomous transit agencies on board, there's a lot of moving pieces when it comes to the fi fiscal impact of a program this large. Um, we'll have those final details at the end of the year. We're, we're, you know, step by step. We just wanted to make sure it was very clear in the budget that we are going to be funding this. Uh, and I think the fact that it is in our fiscal plan signals that we uh, sort of have estimates that we are working through with the transit agencies, but it's something that's worth it to raise uh, transit uh, ridership and make it more affordable for the everyday community. We have viewers in Northern Ontario, so I'm going to ask you about restoring the Northlander, which you have pledged to do. Where is the current plan at? Well, I'm really proud of this uh, initiative, Steve, because the great people of the North never should have been cut out of the Northlander passenger rail service. As you know, it was cancelled uh, 11 years ago, but our government's bringing it back. And I think the first serious signal that, uh, you know, we want to do this the right way is by purchasing three brand new train sets uh, from Siemens. I mean, these are... Steve, these are beautiful trains, uh, state-of-the-art, uh, all the amenities you can imagine, uh, meal service, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, you know, much nicer trains than uh, we used to have uh, for the north. Uh, you know, the next step is to plan sort of the infrastructure planning, the station work, the engineering around uh, that. But the, the good news is because we're piggybacking off a larger order with these train purchases, we expect to receive these trains in the mid-2020s and hopefully have the uh, line operational very shortly after that. Where are they made? In California, it's in uh, the Siemens plant there. As I said, this is a, off of a VIA plant order. Um, and the challenge there was uh, we wanted to make sure that we got it as quickly as possible with as uh, state-of-the-art technology as we could get. You know I'm going to ask this question. We got a plant up in Thunder Bay. Mm -hmm. Used to be Bombardier. Now it's Alstom, French. But at least it's in Ontario. Uh, how come you didn't go that route? Very happy and uh, pleased with the work Alstom is doing. They have nine open contracts uh, with our government currently, and, and they're very busy. Um, constant communication with them, and we know that they're going to have a lot of work to do with a $70 billion investment into transit expansion. Uh, it wasn't the right fit for this project, Steve. Uh, the question was, well, if we go to open market and open procurement, there's a process, perhaps years before we even award the contract. Uh, and at that point, then you have the years to construct. It was simply too long to wait for the great people of the North. I mean, let's remember the Northlander is a vital link to connect indigenous communities, more remote communities, to critical services like health care, uh, to education. You know, I was up in the North and I met uh, a lady who owns the Cochrane Station Inn restaurant, a, a, a indigenous woman who has a great success story. And Steve, if you're ever up in Cochrane, the best bannock you're ever going to taste. She's a <laughs> talented lady. Candace is her name. Um, but she was telling me how she used to take the Northlander passenger rail, how it meant so much to her family and, and her path to prosperity. We need to reestablish those links as quickly as possible. Possible, it was the prudent thing to do to piggyback off the larger hoard or order so that they're going to have that service restored as quickly okay. as possible. I haven't been to Cochrane in about five years, but I wrote Candace's name down, and you can Perfect. give me her coordinates afterwards. <laughs> For sure. Cost of the three new trains? $139.5 million. Now, the reason the Liberals cancelled this 11 years ago is because they said the business case for keeping this line alive just wasn't there anymore. What do you see that apparently they didn't? I'll tell you, the first thing I saw in North Bay was uh, tears in the eyes of a lady who came up to me right before the announcement. Now, as a politician, you don't always know how that conversation will go when someone comes up to you teary-eyed, but, you know, they were tears of joy because she was on that uh, last train serving meals, actually, in the car when, the, when, when it was the final sort of journey um, after, after it was cancelled. This is really meaningful uh, for people up there. And I don't think that people understand how meaningful it is until you go up and, and you know, you sort of see the impact it had on communities. Look, I'm 
Toronto born and raised, I love my city, but there's a big province out there. And, and the people uh, across the north have told me firsthand how important this connection is for them, whether it is to get to school or to get to healthcare or just for their general quality of life. Uh, winters are harsh up there. There should be another option for the north. Now, I'd like to see which transit agency out there is a, a profit uh, you know, making machine. I don't know no, no, many. I, I get you. They all need subsidization uh, for sure, but, but apparently the Northlander line in the past needed a level of subsidization that the previous government just wasn't prepared to do anymore. Why are you prepared to well, do it? This government is saying to the North very clearly that we value you, your partners in our yeah, but prosperity. But can you afford this? And the, the beauty of this train is, Steve, this is, a, this is not the old train that we had before. We're looking at uh, opportunities for tourism. Imagine going from Union Station all the way up to James Bay, Hudson's Bay, connecting the third coast, really, of our Arctic coast, our oldest trading area with settlements that go back all 400 years or something like that. I think there is a tourism opportunity here. When we look at the population growth in Ontario of hundreds of thousands of people every single year, I'm an optimist. We're working actually currently with the chambers of commerce, the local municipalities up and down the line or the proposed line, and saying, like, what can we do here to generate some tourism dollars to make this line a little bit less of a fiscal impact? But certainly we are confident that ridership will return to the north, and we're going to do our part to make sure it's an attractive um, mode of travel. And to confirm, it's not Timmins that the final terminus is, right? All the way to Cochrane. That's right. There will be a connection to Cochrane, and then, of course, the Polar Bear Ex Express connects from Cochrane all the way up to Moosonee. So you can go from Union uh, Station all the way up to James Bay. Okay. I want to finally ask you about uh, what I think is the most expensive construction project in the whole country right now, and that is the light rail transit line that is being built about 200 meters north of where you're s sitting right now. Uh, the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, which was supposed to have been completed last fall, and experts have now said there is, quote, no credible plan to finish it. That was what was announced a few months back. What's the status of this thing right now? Well, Steve, I share the frustrations of, of the lo local residents and, and businesses. You it know. goes through your riding, I think, doesn't well, it? Well, very well, close it, to my riding, will, certainly. Anyway. And yeah. my riding and, and this area, they're transit hubs with, uh, you know, uh, well, they're, 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 they're very important hubs uh, within the city and, and beyond. And so I understand that frustration. You know our government inherited this this project. Now, look, it's, it's not enough to just... You know, blame other political stripes and for generations transit simply didn't get built and that's not my point here. My point though is to say um, when things aren't done perfectly and nobody ever does them perfectly there are lessons to be learned. Now when it comes to the Eglinton Crosstown lots of lessons uh, have been learned. I'll give you just one quick example. I mean there's years of delay in the project. Here's one of the reasons why. Every time you wanted to break ground uh, near a station or after construction was complete, every time you wanted to get the permit to close and clean up uh, that area, you would have to apply for a new permit, and that would be every single station down the entire line. Now, you can imagine, with that many stops, how much time that would add to the process of actually getting shovels in the ground or getting this line operational. Whose rules exactly were those? What happened. Well, these were the rules sort of through the city. I mean, there were some other uh, legislative uh, hurdles, red tape, if this is the very definition of red tape. And so the first thing we did was pass the Building Transit Fast Track in 2018 to streamline uh, the process. And I know this is, it doesn't help uh, the business that have closed and are suffering now, but it does say when we have uh, four priority subway projects being constructed as we speak, we are able to learn from those lessons. And it is already producing results. You know there's shovels in the ground when it comes to the Ontario line, uh, but the Eglinton West extension is more than halfway dug. It's a month ahead of schedule, and we're confident uh, that we can learn from these uh, frustrations that the people have gone through. The Crosstown uh, will be operational. We just need to make sure it's done in a safe way, and, and I think we're at a very important juncture where some of that work is uh, producing some good results. So there is a credible plan to finish it as we speak? There's an absolute credible plan to opening the Eklund Crosstown. It will be operational. When? We just have to make sure that it is safe. That important work is undergoing now, and the answer to that question, Steve, is as soon as it is safe to do so. Which will, it, it, unlikely it will be this year, fair to say? We're hoping that it's as soon as possible, really hoping. I know what as soon as possible <laughs> means, which is a way of not answering the question, but what is, what is, What's the deadline you're looking well, at right I now? I promise you this, Steve. As soon as I have that uh, firm, concrete date, your first call I'm going to make and tell you, <laughs> here will not, it is. Will not be me. I know that. But anyway, OK. Uh, when it was set to open, it was supposed to be, I think, a, a, a tad under $6 billion. Do we know what the final price tag is going to be now? We don't have final numbers, uh, but, you know, whether it's the Crosstown, the Ontario line, when we were doing our capital plans four years ago, well, it was a different world, right? Uh, you know, and I think Jurisdictions around the planet have seen supply chain challenges, labor challenges, inflation, inflation. Uh, but 
that's why it's important to build sort of prudence uh, into your fiscal planning. And, and you, you saw in, in Minister Bethenfalvy's budget a couple of weeks back that, you know, we have reestablished the path to balance. In fact, we're three years ahead of our schedule to balance the budget. Uh, and that's important because that gives us a little bit of that fiscal wiggle room when the unexpected occurs, the save for a rainy day occurs, um, that we're able to weather those storms. The provincial organization responsible for implementing these huge projects is called Metrolinx. Do you have confidence in Metrolinx's ability to bring this in? Absolutely do. Um, this isn't the only the largest transit agency uh, in our country. I, look, you got to sometimes feel for them. They, ha they have to run the day-to-day -day operations of the largest transit agency in Canada, but they also have been tasked with the largest transit expansion plan uh, in Canadian history. I mean, the, you're looking at 70 plus billion dollars when it comes to transit uh, investments alone. Um, monumental tasks. Then throw on top of that modernizing fares with presto payments. Talk about uh, fare service integration. They have a lot on their plate is what I'm saying, Steve. And I know that they have a great team over there. I communicate with them regularly. I, I know the CEO and I, Phil Verse, we have regular conversations, whether it be through text or phone calls or meeting face to face to say these are some big priorities, uh, but I know they're up to the task and they'll deliver for us. And, and, but they're in the, in the middle of, I don't know if they're still in the middle of lawsuits, but they were in the middle of lawsuits. Are they still with two of the organizations that are supposed to be building this LRT? Well, anything that's uh, in front of the courts, I mean, we'd have to leave there, but uh, this, this expansion plan as we move forward, they, they have a lot of conversations, consultations with the communities that are involved. Uh, monumental task, as I said, and we trust our partners to deliver on those outcomes. Who do, I mean, uh, this question is based on the conversations I have with people who, you know, because we're here, right? We're, we're right along Eglinton and I talk to lots of people all the time about this and one of the things they want to know is, who do you blame for the dog's breakfast that this LRT has become? What's the answer? <laughs> well, I'm an optimist, Stephen. You know, look, different political stripes, uh, you can blame them all you want till you're blue in the face. Uh, the point is, it doesn't matter who it was, over decades and decades. This isn't a problem of, of lacking transit that happened overnight. This is decades of poor planning decisions and simply not getting shovels in the ground from all levels of government at all political stripes. Um, I think we can learn lessons from the mistakes past. The point is now we have the largest transit expansion plan in Canadian history. Mm. I think it's time to roll up our sleeves, work together to actually get this thing built, and that's what I'm focused on. Last question. It does feel, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but it does feel as if it's almost impossible nowadays for some legitimate and some illegitimate reasons to bring big infrastructure projects in on time and on budget. Does it feel that way to you too? I'm, uh, as I said, Steve, a big optimist. You can be an optimist, but be a realist but, but as I'm well. But I'm also being a realist, and that's where I'm going with that. I think that when you have a project of this size, you know the infrastructure investments in this province uh, across the transportation network, uh, as well as transit, are, are over $99 uh, billion. It is by far the most aggressive infrastructure in terms of just transit and transportation planning uh, and investments we have ever seen in this country. And I think that's very meaningful. Now, when you have that much work on your plate and moving um, yeah, at, at that speed, yeah, there, there are going to be a lot of conversations had. There's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, uh, different entities, agencies, uh, broader public sector uh, companies uh, involved in that. But I think, I think generally we're heading in the right direction. When you look at the priorities that we're putting into the skilled trades to actually have the people to fill those jobs that we're creating, getting rid of streaming, it's as simple as that from the education system to allow more kids to enter the skilled trades. Uh, you heard Minister Lecce announce that there will be now an, a, a co-op internship uh, opportunity straight out of high school into some of those uh, highly needed uh, uh, jobs of the future. And I think uh, it's working. You remove $8 billion from, from doing the cost of business here in Ontario every single year. And since 2018, there's been a, a net gain of 600,000 good paying jobs in this province. And I think that's what we need to focus on is that, look, Steve, if I may, my, my dad and my mom came to this country 50 years ago with little more than the shirts on their back. And they worked seven days a week tirelessly to try and make ends meet. And they live that Canadian dream, because when my dad and my mom retired, they employed 200 families uh, throughout the greater Toronto area. Mm -hmm. If we want to keep that world-class uh, quality of life, because for those hundreds of thousands of people that are moving here every single year, critical services include getting people connected and going from point A to point B, and that's what we're focused on. See this phone? Yes, sir. I'm going to be sitting by this phone waiting for your call for when the LRT <laughs> is going to be opening because I've got you on record here saying I'm your first call. Can I invite you to the ribbon cutting? You sure can. All right, deal. That's Stan Cho. He's the Associate Minister of Transportation for the province of Ontario and represents Willowdale in the legislature. Minister, thanks for coming into TVO tonight. Thanks so much for having me, Steve.
Ontario says that by the end of 2023, it aims to bring all transit riders in the Greater Toronto Area into one integrated fare system, including those riding the Toronto Transit Commission. The idea is riders would pay one fare, for example, to take a bus in York Region to a GO train and then connect with a subway or streetcar in Toronto. Reese Martin is an independent transportation consultant and he joins us now for his take on the feasibility of the province's plan. Welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. All right. When it comes to fares, in one word, just how fragmented is the GTHA transit system today? Extremely. Why? I think it's because of a historical uh, desire to keep the various systems that the municipalities have is separate because it would be kind of politically uh, toxic to touch them and kind of get involved in the local business. All right, I'm going to do a little scenario. You actually came to us via York Region. Mm -hmm. What was your transit uh, commute like? Uh, so I got on a York Region bus. I had to tap at the station for the bus. I then got to Finch Station. I had to go down and to the entirely separate TTC portion of Finch Station because can't share mm -hmm. stations, they're <laughs> separate. Uh, and then I had to pay again to get on the TTC, ride the subway over here. So, yeah. From where you stand, how important is a fare integration to the province's transit future? It's critical. Like, it's sort of like if you had, if you had a highway and the only way you were allowed to drive on it was if you could prove you were a resident of the city the highway was in. Can you imagine like if someone's driving across the province and every time they have to sort of check in with the with the local highway authority? Can you imagine how bad driving would be? It's that's the way transit is right now. Like we do not have an integrated system. You have to pay separately at every single city boundary and that's bad. Really bad. All right, so you watched our interview with the Ontario's yeah. uh, Associate Minister of Transportation, Stan Cho. He has promised fully funded fare integration between Toronto and surrounding regions by the end of this year. Do you have any concerns with his plan? I mean, I, I think the first thing I want to say is it's great that this is something we're actually talking about because it's crazy. It's 2023 and we haven't done this yet. <laughs> Everywhere else has. So it's good that we're doing this. Where is everywhere? the rest of the world that does <laughs> transit really properly. <laughs> and even in Canada, Vancouver and Montreal have integrated fares across the region. And so we're playing catch up, not just with the rest of the world, the rest of Canada is ahead of us as well. Uh, I definitely have concerns because we talk about integration and it's like, what does that mean? And there's, there's a whole swath of things that integration could be. And so it's not really, we're doing integration. It's like, what is our scheme for integration? Let's talk about the details. Uh, Perhaps some would say there's not a lot. How detailed would you say their plan is? Not that detailed. There's fares are just complicated because there's so many possible trips people could make. And so there are some broad things that a lot of people do, like get on the GO train and then maybe get on the TTC. And so it's good to know what would happen in that case. But what happens if I want to go from TTC to York or if I want to go from York to Brampton? What if I have a monthly pass? What if I'm low income? These are all like important details to a fully thought out uh, integration scheme. And we don't have those details. And so it's good that we're talking about it. But we need those details to determine whether this is a, you know, is a three out of 10 or a five out of 10 <laughs> or an eight out of 10 scheme. Uh, in terms of the money, mm -hmm. uh, roughly how much money do you think it would cost to do something like this? The Toronto Region Board of Trade has this report that I think is really helpful. And they estimated the cost was like around 150 million a year, which is nothing compared to the amount we're spending on transit projects. And it's, it's this kind of classic thing. You want to buy the nice new car, but you don't want to put gas in it, right? You need to fund these programs so that transit is actually accessible. And so it's not insane when you're, you're trying to go from one system to the next and you're paying three times. And so I think that um, the cost is probably in the couple hundred million a year a bucket. That's a small cost to pay for a sensible transit system, I think. I want to go behind sort of what uh, the, the mechanics or, or sort of what uh, who's paying for it at mm -hmm. the end of the day. Uh, will local transit agencies, including the TTC, be reimbursed? How does that, what does that look like? They say that they will be, and I think that that's like the approach, the, the first question the TTC would ask. The question I would ask is, why do all the transit agencies, they're so worried about their bottom line, but they don't seem to have like kind of a growth mindset of, hey, if it's easier for people to take transit, maybe they're going to get on the TTC more, right? And I think that 
that's the really weird thing to see as an I grew up in Vancouver where transit is integrated and you sort of can imagine how hey like if it's easy I might take a trip from Brampton to, to Toronto or I might take a trip from York to Brampton that's extra ridership that you could be picking up but we have this really closed-minded attitude that oh, I need to protect what I have today because I, I that's how I make my money and there's no hey, like, how can I grow and be a bit entrepreneurial and pick up new trips and people who might ri not ride transit otherwise? Let's talk about some of the other concerns for local transit agencies. Of course, also like the TTC, the largest in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, they're worried about integration because it could mean lost revenue, it could mean job losses. And this is at a time, of course, when ridership is at its lowest, when we have violence on the TTC as well. How worried should they be that this could negatively impact them and, and ultimately maybe perhaps their autonomy as well? I mean, I think that they need to be cautious, or at least they need to be thoughtful, because of course, this is a big policy change for them. But I think if they do the right things, it's a bonanza for them. Like, there are so many people who can use all of the Go Transit service that we're introducing these days and, and uh, come into Toronto and then, hey, maybe I'm in Markham and I want to take a bus last mile, and so I'm connecting from a Go station. If the TTC kind of adapts their model and, and looks at opportunities that this opens up, there's tons of potential for them. And I don't think they need to worry about job losses or about losing revenue. Like, I, I think this is actually going to make transit more competitive with driving. And so it will mean more ridership for TTC. And that's what they should be hunting for right now, because as you mentioned, down at the moment. Sorry, so those, there's those worries, but there is also a worry of time lags. We're in April, there's not a lot of time left. Uh, do you, are you optimistic that this plan will happen by the end of the year? I, I am optimistic that something will happen. Uh, it's not clear exactly the details of the plan, but the good thing about having Presto for all of its woes mm -hmm. is that these things can change pretty quickly if they want them to. And so I actually think it's totally doable by the end of the year if they want to. It's a question of, of kind of willpower, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely possible to it's a few lines of code changes, a few, a few ones and zeros, and then people <laughs> are paying different fares now. All right, Reese, it was really great. We look forward to it. Maybe we'll bring you on when uh, the plan is actually in place. Uh, thank Sounds you so good. much. Thanks for having me on. That is the agenda for Monday, April 10th, 2023. How does it happen that police announce a huge drug bust, but then when it comes time for trial, the cases collapse? We'll explore that tomorrow. I'm Jane Jagnathan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and Steve, we'll see you again tomorrow.